Uh, good afternoon. This is Tuesday, February 12th, and you are watching the Vermont House Human Services Committee um, and our testimony um, this afternoon is about residential treatment for justice involved youth in particularly the movement that the state is uh, taking towards um, the new uh, program. Uh, so thank you very much. And Commissioner, I will ask you to start off. And I, we have um, several people from uh, the Department of Children and Families, and I would ask you to um, be the conductor of who is going when, and to let us know if you want us to interrupt you or you'd like folks to get a chance to talk first. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Yes, uh, as we introduced Erica Radke uh, um, at the start, um, and also um, Jennifer Herber. Also with us today is Jennifer Micah, our general counsel for the department. She started in September. And then also uh, Judy Rex, who's our director of policy. And uh, the team with you today has been very involved in the work and the development of the new Cover Bridges Treatment Program, as we're now calling it, um, <clears throat> and working with Beckett. We provided um, um, when we were to testify at the end of last week, we provided three documents to the committee. Um, one was a high level PowerPoint, just to kind of level set of uh, how we got to where we are, given you do have some new committee members. Um, also uh, a draft description of the uh, treatment program that's being developed in conjunction uh, with their uh, uh, Beckett's team, but also with Jennifer Herbert. Um, and then also um, some uh, schematics of uh, what the final drawings are looking like for the new treatment center. And so I could start with the overview and then I would probably hand it off to the team to kind of talk about the different components. I was hoping that, you know, given this is the Human Services Committee, you'd want to focus on the, the treatment program aspect to some degree today. And that's why we have Jennifer here because she's very well uh, versed in, in um, the, the, the program and the new tools that are being developed to assess and work, work with the youth. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, can uh, do, can you do the document share, or do you need? Oh, I think I would need Julie. I'm working from home on a very small laptop today, and I'm. Um, I would say I'm. All, I would be technically challenged to talk and work both at the same time. Okay, she's <laughs> she's got it. Okay. Thank you. And just for people who are um, listening, th these documents are on our committee webpage for um, under today's date, um, which is February 12th. So just jumping to the next slide of, of the presentation, um, this is just some background for uh, the committee to refresh your memory for the new members. Um, the last youth left Woodside at the end of August and, and no, and we a decision was made not to allow any further admissions to the facility. Um, at that point, we sought legislative authority um, uh, to close the facility, um, working with the legislature. Um, the restatement budget <clears throat> included language authorizing us to permanently um, cease operations and close the facility on or before October 18th. Um, we permanently closed the facility on October 7th. So as of right now, the facility is closed and it's been in some ways decommissioned and um, all, all of the equipment and records have been moved out and whatnot. And so um, it's sitting idle and empty on, on that space over in Colchester. Um, also, we were asked to submit um, a, a, a report to the legislature on our long-term plan for justice involved youth. Um, and we did so on October 20th um, and then uh, presented that to the legislature. Julie, if we could move to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> that plan um, was considered by um, the legislative uh, joint legislative justice oversight and child protection oversight committees. Um, we had several uh, hours and days of testimony on the plan and uh, hearing from various uh, states attorneys association, uh, the defender general, uh, BSEA, um, uh, Judge Grierson and others um, coming in on the plan. And on November 12th, uh, those committees voted <clears throat> to, a, to recommend approval of our plan 
with the following conditions, um, that we work with local government of Newberry and hold community meetings regarding the use of the facility, um, that all uh, juvenile and the state's custody sh shall reside and receive treatment in the least restrictive setting, um, that only justice involved youth be at the facility and that it have a no eject, no reject policy, that a person with PhD level clinical experience will have oversight of the facility and the programming at the facility, um, and that in negotiating the lease, we'll ensure the state's financial investment in the facility be recaptured if the plan for the facility falls through. <clears throat> and so uh, that recommendation then went, uh, according to the budget language, to the Joint Fiscal Committee, who met on November 20th and voted um, to approve the plan with the five recommendations that were uh, submitted by the Joint Justice and Child Protection Oversight Committees. And then we submitted an update uh, report um, in, uh, in early January about uh, the status of the Woodside appropriations. And that's kind of led us to where we are uh, right now in the work we've been doing over the last several months, working with Beckett um, and the architects uh, uh, on the proposed renovations and also the proposed treatment um, uh, plan uh, uh, for the youth in that facility. Um, Julie, if we could, yep. So the partners we've been working with, uh, our, our team at DCF, many of them who are here and there are others, uh, we've been very involved with buildings and general services who've been very helpful in helping us draft um, a proposed lease. Um, also um, working with us in the architects and Beckett on the proposed design and understanding, uh, you know, the flow of buildings and from their experience, it, their uh, contribution has been invaluable. Uh, we are working with a, an architectural firm in White River Junction called Studio Nexus. And then also um, we've been uh, working with our consultants from the Council of Juvenile Justice Administrators um, as we you know, work to do the design and the programming piece um, to, to move this forward. You know, Beckett has been engaging you know, the, the Newberry Select Board um, uh, and the Development Review Board and the Zoning Board. Um, and then we also um, were planning for a community forum. We had our first last night. And then we, there's another one scheduled for, uh, I believe it's March 4th. Um, uh, so it was How did a several it go? hours. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to say, um, I, I think it was um, a, a well attended virtual meeting. So it was a, a different format and included the select board. Um, they actually had a moderator, someone to come in and mo moderate the meeting, and, um, and that went really well. Um, so we had our team there, the Beckett team was there, and the architects were there, kind of went over. Uh, the proposed treatment plan and the renovations to the building and the site plan. And then we heard um, from community members um, were each given three minutes to ask questions or, or, or make statements and then we responded to their questions. I would say it was a very productive meeting. Um, and I would say that we heard what we would think were very uh, uh, appropriate uh, concerns regarding um, a secure residential treatment facility in their community. There was a lot of questions about the types of youth that we would have there, um, how secure is the building going to be. Um, they expressed concerns that Newberry um, is about a half hour away from uh, different law enforcement responses. Um, and they were particularly concerned about um, you know, what happens if a youth eloped from the facility. And we particularly heard some concerns um, regarding residents who live on a road, um, it's called Fish Pond Road, who live on the way to the facility. This facility is on its own private road, about a half a mile up, I give or take a little bit, on, on a pretty large parcel. But there were residents on Fish Pond Road who, who are expressed some particular concern about um, safety issues. And so we're going to follow up with those um, residents um, uh, directly and work with them and hear their concerns. I think we want to work with the community, particularly around um, security and um, what we can do to assure uh, the community and the residents of, of uh, on that road in particular that um, we want to be responsive to their concerns and that, um, you know, there are many ways that we can do that and we're open to working with them to give them the level of reassurance 
um, they need um, for this project to move forward in their community. Um, also, uh, there was some concerns expressed um, just regarding you know, who was gonna own the facility um, and did that mean that, that the property would be removed from their tax rolls? Um, you know, we are working on a lease, so it'll be Beckett owned and, and they'll be paying property taxes. Although we will have an option to purchase the property at some point if the state so chooses. But at this time, it's, it's, it's not um, a moving forward with a purchase, but a lease. Um, and then I would uh, turn to Jennifer, who's there. If I missed anything, Jennifer, real quick, in terms of what we heard last night at the meeting. And just, um, Jennifer, just maybe after that, I see that Representative McFawn has a question. And so um, is that, can you wait till um, we, or can we wait till Jennifer finishes the questions and concerns? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've, overall, I think the feedback and the questions and concerns that we received last night are only going to help in creating a well-rounded program for the community, the youth and staff moving forward. They were, they were really good questions. Um, and some of the questions have been part of the conversation as of lately uh, about transportation and um, access to services to support um, a program that is serving a difficult group of, of youth. Um, and I think, like Sean said, our next meeting is March 4th. So uh, overall, it was good. And I'll be happy to share with you a little bit about the Covered Bridge Treatment Center. If we could just go to the next slide. Uh, Je Jennifer, before we go there, I believe yeah. that Representative McFawn has a question that is oh, probably, right, right, probably right. related to um, this point that you and the commissioner are talking about. Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. If, if this has been talked about before, just say so. Um, what kind of a facility did Beckett have prior to this renovation? So um, the renovations haven't occurred. They're at this point just uh, uh, schematics, designs, and proposed. Uh, before that, they were using the facility um, uh, to serve eight to 12 uh, 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 boys um, and, and a, like a tree treatment assessment center. And it was a staff secure facility at that point. It was not a building secure facility. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Who's, who's ever next? That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> So I can I'm gonna I can give a brief overview of the uh, program development and the process, and then I'm happy to go further into any areas where people may have questions. Um, it's been thus far a very collaborative process. We've had experts in the areas of juvenile justice reform um, with the CJJA, the Council of Juvenile Justice Administrators. Um, and collaboration with Dr. Lorraine Baker and Jeff Karen, who, who have developed the program description um, and working with Disability Rights Vermont and taking their input and feedback, which has been really helpful. And I think having uh, a roundtable discussion and uh, thoughtfulness around how to create a program that kind of thinks across boundaries um, has been really useful and helpful in developing a program that's going to be responsive in both the design um, and the programming to the level of acute need that these youth will come in presenting with. Um, and so the program is uh, utilizes evidence-based modalities and is trauma-informed from the time that the youth arrives and all the way through the program. Um, it's also trauma-informed in an organizational framework way um, in the response to staff and management. Uh, and uh, there's a real understanding of adolescent development that's, that's interwoven into the program's approach. Um, and I think uh, part of what's really important with this group of youth is um, promoting healing through connection back into the community. And that also begins at intake and is uh, consistent throughout the program 
there's a, a strong permanency component where there a plan is developed and there's permanency coordinators that are integrated into the milieu and develop relationships with the youth and serve as a liaison to them moving on to their next steps and a strong family engagement piece. So initially the family right away is, is engaged to develop both the personal safety plan and the treatment plan and really work with the youth and the staff to develop a comprehensive approach to next steps. Um, I think it also does a really nice job of taking a framework that is uh, trauma-informed on an organizational level as well, which is really important because I think in this type of work, it can be so demanding and, and having adequate supports is so important. Um, and there's training and ongoing wellness planning for staff that's built into the program design. And then there will be quality assurance and oversight that is also trauma-informed, which is also important in recognizing, you know, these, these systems are under chronic stress and there can be changes that go on. And so recognizing early signs of if staff need a reset or things that might need to change in terms of policy and procedure is really important. Um, and so overall it's been, I think we've taken, we've drawn on best practices from the field in both juvenile justice reform in design and program. And then also best practice in terms of trauma and adolescent development and put it together to create what is a pretty thorough comprehensive approach to a stabilization program for these youth. I don't know if anyone has any questions. You're muted. Uh, I was going to say, good. Um, I interrupted you. And yes, I do see um, Representative Wood has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jennifer, um, thanks for this overview. I'm curious on the um, program evaluation and oversight in the QA functions. Um, so uh, when you outline this, um, I probably should be more aware of what DCF has in this regard with regard to sort of all of the residential programs that you contract for. But um, is there a, a team at DCF that, that does site visits? Uh, are you reliant only on licensing? How, how is that going to happen? Well, that's actually uh, part of uh, this, <laughs> this new role and position um, is I will be overseeing that and working collaboratively with um, RLSI in the FSD division and um, uh, Jennifer, yeah. um, um, lots of initials. And oh, <laughs> residential, I'm, I'm sorry, residential licensing and special investigations. Uh, which is a unit within the Division of, of Family Services uh, that, that oversees um, the residential programming. So I'll be working in collaboration with them quite a bit. But the, in my role, I will be providing a level of clinical oversight to the programming and um, the placement process of youth throughout our system of care. Um, yeah. And so, so Sean might have something to add to that, but. I, I was gonna say, um, Special investigations, that really is, I want to say, abuse, if, if I'm, please, rather than my saying what I think it is, would you explain what, what that is and how that relates to Representative Wood's question? Because didn't you so, say that so, that was so, uh, Sure, I could jump in here, thank you. Um, so, so that unit has a, a couple different functions. So one, any residential program that wants to operate in Vermont needs to be licensed by, that will serve youth. It will be, needs to be licensed by um, the family services, to, by, this, by the Department of Children and Families. And this unit is the licensing body. Um, you know, that there's a series of regulations that programs and rules that programs need to meet. Um, and this team goes in and works with the provider on to make sure their program um, meets all of those requirements before they receive a license. They also do periodic reviews and assessments of the program to see how they're doing, but also if specific um, 
uh, concerns are brought to our attention in a way a, a youth, uh, you know, like a youth might have been treated improperly. They have um, investigators that will go out and look specifically into um, that concern um, and meet with the youth or the youth's family, also interview program staff um, and, make, and make a determination. Where you might have seen some of their most recent work um, was um, within in early in my tenure, um, it, it, it was in the news a little bit regarding Kern Hatton and that um, they had been working with Kern Hatton over some, al some allegations and investigations and um, Kern Hatton decided uh, you know, that we could, that, that they would stop being a licensed treatment program based on our findings and work with them. And so that's kind of the work of, of, of that unit. So it's a little separate from our, our, our other pieces of the department that uh, investigate specific allegations of, of, of abuse and neglect out in the community. Mm. Madam Chair, can I follow up for one Absolutely, second? absolutely. So, um, I think what um, what I am, am uh, I, I hear what you're saying. It sounds like a you know a licensing kind of review, and, and licenses last for how long? How how long is periodic? I, I would have to refer to our licensing team and get back. I I think they can vary. Okay, yeah. um, so um, so that would be helpful. I'm I'm I understand the sort of the investigatory aspect of it. Um, so that's usually complaint driven investigations usually are complaint driven, um, you know, when something rises to that level. Um, I guess what I am interested in this maybe sounds more a little bit along what uh, Jennifer was talking about is if there's any regular whether it's an annual quality assurance review or, you know, twice a year or once every other year, something that is different from licensing, you know, the um, you know, that really looks at qualitatively, how are we doing and how are the outcomes for the youth who are there and really honestly try to um, address things that might become apparent during that type of review before it gets to a, a place where, you know, you have somebody alleging abuse or something like that. Um, so it's, it's really uh, before that level of investigation and, um, so I'm just I'm just curious as to how you approach that from um, you know a quality improvement um, perspective. Yeah, so you know the licensing team does do uh, periodic um, reviews of the programs, and I, I I would have them come in if if you wanted more details, just to make sure um, you know that they're still in compliance with their licensing conditions, and that we're not seeing areas of concern like you, like you testified to. And then if they do identify an area, um, depending on the level of, of the concern, there's different paths it can take in terms of working for the program to come back into uh, compliance per se or whatever the, the concern we, we issued. Um, in terms of, I think of youth outcomes, I think is the other component of, of your question, Representative Wood, I think that's what led us to create the new clinical position in, in the commissioner's office for that qualitative piece. Like, how are our kids doing? Are they, are, you know, are they, are the programs that we're using meeting their needs? How long are they staying? Um, how quickly do they step down to a, a, a lower level of, of services? How quickly are we getting them back into the community? Those, I think, are the, the, the work that we really see this new clinical services director uh, doing as a part of the body of that work of that new position, because I think that's a piece that, um, you, you, you know, we've been missing. And, you know, I think we, it, it, it happened in bits and pieces at times, but there was not a consistent focus on it in the department. And that led us to kind of think that th this would be a role for this new position that Jennifer's now um, taken on for the department. Okay, yeah, thank Matt. you. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to, it would help um, if, uh, you know, you could maybe uh, follow up with sort of the frequency and what periodic means um, and really how, um, how Jennifer's role as clinician is going to interface with, you, you know, the licensing um, unit, that would be helpful. Sure. And it looked like Jennifer Micah wanted to say something. She's taken herself off thank mute. You. Yes, thank you. Uh, Representative Wood, one of the We'll be addressing a lot of these issues within the context of the contract that we have with Beckett. 
We'll be having requirements around um, whether there were any seclusions, whether there were any accidents, all, you know, uh, quality assurance issues around that will be within the context of that contract. So we are, and we are working on that, those things now, but we haven't, because we've been focusing so much on how to build the build, we haven't gotten into the nitty gritty of that yet, but we see a lot of that being part of uh, requirements of running the program. Thank you. I, I appreciate actually the fact that you're thinking about those things as part of the contract. Um, and then the important part will, uh, you know, adherence to the contract and making sure that that's happening. So thank you for the follow up. And, and there is um, a question from Representative McFawn. Well, Madam Chair, I was trying to look for it in the building, but um, I'll ask this question. Um, medical treatment. Um, is, uh, is that going to be staffed in the facility or how close are they to medical treatment? Sure. So um, I can jump in here. So there is a clinical space in the building. Um, it's near where youth, when they come in, they will go through a, a, an assessment. Um, there will be a nurse on site on staff um, to work with the youth. Um, in terms of nearest uh, facilities, um, they're probably 25 minutes from uh, the hospital in St. Johnsbury. Don't quote me on the time and the distance, but, um, it, and then they're about 45 minutes away from Dartmouth-Hitchcock. And then they are also closer to, uh, I believe it's Cottage Hospital in Woodsville. So that, and then also about an hour away to the west in Berlin would be the Central Vermont Hospital. So they are kind of like in the middle of a, of a healthcare triangle, you know, I don't know if I would call the triangle, but. Yeah. So they're quite a ways then from uh, any trauma-based place. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner or Jennifer Herbert, <coughs> what we are seeing is slide six of seven. I don't know if you were, if there's, an, if there's another slide we should see or if we should take um, the slides off. Oh, let's just quickly see. I think um, uh, the, the next slide, I believe, if you, if you move, is oh. just kind of an overview of the next steps where we're at, just a high level, quickly walk you through. We're finalizing. Okay. Um, the floor plan and the, the schematic designs. Um, uh, uh, also the site plan, the, you know, the, the site plan of the actual, uh, uh, you know, site that, that it's gonna be on, um, you know, in terms of like where the parking lot will be relocated to and where the um, outdoor recreational area will be located for the youth to be able to get outside and, and, and exercise. Um, and then we would generate the final construction drawings and specifications um, for um, contractors to bid on it. Um, we would be then applying for um, uh, the local uh, permits um, from, from, the, from the community. Um, also, uh, we would need, there'll be some state building permits regarding like fire and, and egress and, and whatnot for a facility like this. Um, also, you know, we're still in the midst of uh, working with the community and that will that work will happen um, into and throughout March and um, working with the community address their concerns and come up with safety response plans and whatnot. Um, and then it, the project would go out to bid and we and then with the goal that con construction if all the pieces fall into place would begin in May. Um, and we're not at substantially changing the footprint of, of the of the facility. Um, and so we believe that um, we, we hope to be open and operational um, by the end in December of this year. So um, the fact that the next community meeting is March 4th, you don't see being um, <clears throat> perhaps setting this, the timing of this back a little bit. It, it could be based on our work with the community mm -hmm. and um, 
and their development review boards and zoning boards as well. I mean, so, uh, and that's what I alluded to when I said, if there's no other uh, things that in intervene in the meantime, that, that this is assuming a smooth process throughout. Okay, so um, as we begin to look at this, both <clears throat> from a budgetary point of view, because I would imagine when we look at the budget, um, there are, that there's enough money to, to run a program starting in January, so for six months. So if in fact, there are delays that might impact the amount of money that needs to be in the budget for running the program. Is that fair to say? You know, we left flexibility <laughs> in our budget, understanding that the construction and completion timeline was still was still could be fluid, and and part of the current Woodside or secure residential treatment. Um, DEPT ID, um, in, in not only would it for 22 would include um, uh, funds for the uh, operation of this facility, but also um, for the, uh, the, the treatment of youth in the interim and the different places, uh, systems that we've developed and for placements like the, the Sununu contract that we have. And so ba based on, on that timing, we believe we have the funds available to meet our needs, but you're right, there, there could be an impact there. Um, and so for instance, um, the interim uh, contracts and interim plan to deal with justice involved youth who need a locked um, response, you alluded to Sununu and two, you know, a couple of contracts. Are those up in uh, December? Will they need to be renegotiated? Um, so we, um, when we negotiated our contract <laughs> with Sununu and Jennifer, uh, Micah, jump in if I, if I misspeak, please, um, is a two-year contract um, renewable for two years. And the way that contract is structured we only pay for the days that we actually have youth in that facility. And so far, I think we've um, had a youth in that facility um, late summer into September for four to five weeks um, at this point. And so we only pay for what we use for that contract. Some of the other agreements that we have um, uh, to increase bed capacity and crisis bed capacity, um, uh, would still be in place. And then we would assess uh, whether those would still be needed once this facility opens up and then try to uh, work to downsize them back to the, to the size of the program they were ahead of before we renegotiated their agreement um, to expand to meet some of the, our justice involved youth. Thank you. I have lots of questions, commissioner, but you have a plan. You have a plan for, uh, and this is yes. the first part of the plan in terms of the presentation. So I'm going to um, let you move on to your next phase unless I see questions from other committee members. And just know that we have some questions. Um, so, sure. um, so can we take down this slide? Sure, and I was gonna ask if Julie could put up the, the, uh, the, uh, the PDF of the schematics. And then we would have uh, Jennifer has been really working closely. Jennifer Mike has been working closely um, with Beckett, the architects in BGS and could kind of walk us through what's, what's shaping up to be close to the final uh, footprint and schematic of, of, the, of the treatment center. Um, this will be really interesting and it will be important, I think, for us to understand this. I'm just gonna remind the committee that we are not the capital um, uh, committee um, and those of us who are interior designers or builders to try to remember our focus. So Jennifer, Micah, do you wanna kind of walk us through the work and kind of how, you, how the team has been approaching the design? Sure. Um, so Becca came to us with um, back in 
August, September with this building and the possibility of building, putting the facility in here. And the initial walkthrough indicated that the best place, the most affordable place for the, for the actual program would be in the basement. Um, the basement, you can see in front of you, the basement is at the top, the, um, excuse me, the bedrooms are at the top of the screen and those look out onto the mountainside, the fields and the forests. Um, that's the one place uh, that we are um, building out and that is building out onto an existing concrete uh, patio. So we're not actually changing the footprint, we're just basically, you know, enclosing it. Pertinent to your committee in particular, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to design the building so that it would compel appropriate responses from staff. And what we were thinking about was for, in the forefront of our minds were the lawsuits that the state is facing regarding Woodside and some of the problems that we had there. Some of the problems that um, were most important were the segregation of certain of children in areas of the building. So we tried very hard to avoid allowing there to be a space where a child could be left alone for long periods of time alone. Um, and you'll see that there are the, the building, the bottom is in fact sort of, sort of divided. There are the two bedrooms on the far right, bedrooms five and six, that have the possibility of a closed door separating them. And what we learned from our consultants was that that's actually necessary for trauma-informed care, given that if a particular child is um, acting out or saying things or doing things that um, could trigger a, tr a trauma response in another child, you needed to be able to have children be separated for their own benefit. So, but what we, what we did do was we made sure that none of the bedrooms had their own bath and had their own toilets because you, then you can't leave a child in the room. The idea was to make sure that children were in and out of the rooms and not just in, not left alone. Um, so you have those on the right. The, the, we're still deciding whether they all need to be, um, whether they all need to be soundproof rooms. We haven't settled on that quite yet. We think maybe they don't all have to be, but we should have a couple that will. All the bathrooms are ADA compliant and accessible. Um, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a little square sort of off to the left of the center, which says Lula. That's a small elevator that will go all the way up from the bottom, from the basement, all the way up to the third floor, which we will not be using other than possibly for staff over staff sleeping rooms if there's a, a need for that, but those will not be used for anything. All, all the children will be in this area only in the whole building. Um, the operational office is where you'll have computers and um, that's where staff can be if there are, when people are sleeping or that sort of thing. You'll see there are windows. Um, the sitting areas are intended not to be used frequently during the day. The idea is that the kids will be in the multi-purpose room, in the act academic room or they'll be upstairs having meals. Upstairs on the second floor, you'll see there'll be a couple other rooms that the kids will be using. We have two um, sort of therapeutic rooms down here, the calming room and the clinical office. This schematic actually has them in the wrong place. After talking with, uh, we had a meeting about a week and a half ago with DRVT, uh, Disability Rights Vermont, and we agreed that we should switch those two and that we would also change some names to make them less clinical for the kids, um, like a chill zone or something like that if they needed to, you know, to have a space where they could be alone. All of the materials that we'll be using will be, will, to, the, to the greatest extent possible, will, be, will look home-like. So we're searching a lot to find the kind of wall coverings and flooring that will look like a typical wall, but because of the um, the behaviors of some of the kids, we have to make them really sturdy. Uh, all the windows are going to be, it's, it's, there won't be any guns, but they are bulletproof, which 
is an indication simply of strength and not of the need for actual bulletproof glass. Um, but that sort of thing, you know, you nothing that uh, somebody could punch through or throw something through or poke through, um, both for their own safety and to maintain the integrity of the building. Before we move on to the next slide, I, does anybody have any questions? I have a quick question. This is the basement. It's a lovely building. I mean, where it looks. What's going to happen to the first floor? Right, so if we want to swap, go up to the next slide, I could show oh. you the next floor. Okay. We worked on that transition. <laughs> uh, uh, rep rep Representative, McFawn has, <laughs> Representative McFawn has a question. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Do these windows open? Um, that's a good question and I'm not sure of the answer. Jennifer Herbert, do you know? I don't think so, no. At least not on the not the, the the rooms in the bedrooms. Those won't be able to be opened. This is okay. a secure facility. So the idea is we need to make sure that children cannot leave and that they can't have access to things that might cause harm. So if you had an open window, you could potentially reach out, try to grab something. Um, I think. I think so, so on this first floor where they're going to be most of the time, none mm -hmm. of those windows will be able to be opened. Right. Including the multi-purpose room and et cetera. Correct, right. correct. We do have outdoor facilities though. I mean, outdoor I see um, that. rec fields. Oh, so. Yeah, I see that. Now, my other question is, I see there are two bathrooms on that floor. And if there were six people there plus staff, um, is that, is that considered adequate? Yes, we've been- I, I know that you have a staff bathroom too. So um, our understanding is that it's, it's adequate. We are working with consultants who are experts in the juvenile justice field who are following best practices um, around those kinds of decisions, yeah. Um, and top, my last top, question- Topper, topper yeah. I see four, I see four bathrooms. I see one and then the staff one and then over to the right, it says two. So I count that as four. I thought that was the number of the bathroom. Bathroom yeah. one, bathroom two. Yeah, there are oh. three, there are just three. Okay. Um, now, what was my last question? Ugh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I will note that the the um, multi-purpose room is is quite large. You see, it's twenty four by seventeen, and the other, the academic multi-purpose multi-purpose room, is also large. So there is a lot of space. Yeah, my my, I I just remembered my last question. The clinical office. I noticed that um, there are no sinks or bathrooms or anything in there. Right. It's just a, it's just a therapy room. It's where you would go to meet with your therapist or, I mean, it could be used in any if, number if of ways. If a youth was injured. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what to, um, to, uh, Representative McVaughn's set of questions around how close you are or far you are and who, who is on staff medical. He's not talking about therapy. So yeah. we have a, Sure. We have a on the on the first. If we move to the next slide, the first floor, there is a clinical space um, there as well, where there's an intake here with a nurse and um, sinks and and um, other equipment. So this would be a a, a medical clinical type. Okay. So yes. using, using the same words, clinical, <laughs> clinical. Yes. Sally, medical, social clinical, worker. Medical, Sally, clinical. You know. <laughs> yeah. And I think you know. Am I correct, Representative McFawn, that you were concerned about medical, um, yes. medical, physical care? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm interested if somebody mm -hmm. tries to injure themselves or they are injured, where do they go to get, how do they get treatment? That's the reason I asked about how close they were to medical facilities and what kind of staff is going to be present within the facility. Yeah, so we will have a nurse on staff. And so things that could be um, triaged on site would, would 
occur here on this first floor space um, where it's the intake in the nurse's office and there's also a restroom with a sink and, and whatnot there to, uh, to, to work with the kids medically as well as uh, do, do when they come in for intake as well when they first arrive at the facility. So I can walk you through this a little bit more. Are we ready? Yep. So you can see at the very bottom of the screen, there's a, a vehicle. That's where the transport will come in. They come into the intake room. As, as um, Commissioner Brown noted, there's a nurse. That's where the nursing office will be. We also, after a lot of discussion, we decided we needed to have a shower in that area too, because kids coming in may need an opportunity to get themselves ready to join the milieu. If there's anything that they need to, any personal hygiene needs that they need to address, we wanted to make sure that they had that opportunity. Um, that's where you'll do the intake, the inf information about the child. And then the child will go into the foyer and then back down the stairs or in a Lula lift to the bottom floor. Now this, you'll see that there's a, a rough middle of this schematic. The left-hand side is secure. The right-hand side is not secure, um, except where you see the dark uh, wall. No, that's not true. Just the center, the center is the, the, the line for the, um, excuse me, the security. So the kids can be um, in the dining room. That's where they'll be having their meals. They'll come up the stairs through the foyer and into the dining room. We have the family room. The family room is gonna be a really important room because it is both a family room where kids can meet if appropriate with their family if they wanna come visit. It will also be where we likely have most of the court hearings, uh, virtual court hearings. We've talked with the Defender General and DRVT about that, about making sure that we have adequate um, Wi-Fi and broadband. We're gonna be having to spend um, some money to put in an adequate system or, or adequate broadband in that area. Um, the Defender General advised us that he, what he has found most useful for providing adequate um, legal services is a computer and two cell phones so that the uh, the client can talk to the lawyer confidentially on one phone while also con connecting through the computer to the actual um, court hearing. So that's what that will be used for. It'll be used for other kinds of things too, but those are the primary things we'll be using that room for. It'll have probably couches and a desk and things like that in there. And then there's the exercise room for bad weather days and for kids who want to be doing things like uh, weightlifting and um, you know running machines, things like that, um, we can show you the third floor, which we won't be using, but we could show you anyway, so you see get a better sense of what the building is. It's it it looks like probably what your pic your picture of a country inn looks like, you know, it's a sort of a big rectangular building and it's three and it's two main floors and a, the basement. This top floor was used by the Vermont Assessment Center when they were doing assessments here. We will, as I said, we're not gonna be using this floor but we are putting the Lula lift to the top um, and securing some of the spaces. Do you wanna look at the overall picture of the lot itself? Madam Thanks, Chair? Sir. Yes. Can I, I, can I ask a question? You certainly can. May I? I guess I, sh I, guess I should use proper English. Um, it, uh, Jennifer, if, if you could go um, uh, back to the, um, not the basement, I guess it's the first floor. Um, and uh, I can sort of see the, uh, that it, it appears that there is um, lots of natural light in the building, which um, even though it's secure, that that is important, I think, in terms of um, the overall feel of the building. Um, one of the things you didn't really talk about is the use of the great room. And yeah. um, so what I'm, what I'm um, sort of is rumbling around in my head is, um, 
with my previous experience with group homes and um, programs that are run for you know groups of people, um, there sometimes tends to be this sort of like total separation of um, staff and residents and that, um, so I understand the need for there to be secure parts of the building. Um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, um, and I understand offices, you know, being sort of offices and, you know, off limits, but I'm just trying to get a sense because you made a point of saying that the secure part of the building is on the left-hand side as I'm looking at the plans and we didn't really talk about the great room. And uh, I'm just am hoping that we're not sort of setting up this dichotomy of, you know, staff are always here and, you know, students are always here, you know, left and right. And um, the kitchen, to be honest with me, doesn't look that big for the group of people who are gonna be um, eating here. And I'm just thinking about programming and teaching meals and, you know, teaching cooking and things like that. I'm just, how are all these things fitting together, I guess, um, in this space? So I'll speak to the great room and I think I'll let, let Jennifer Herbert talk about that particular thing. This is, so the, the great room, as you point out, is not going to be used for the children. Um, and we expect there to be one-to-one -one staffing for the kids. So there will always be a lot of staff in the, in the room, in the main living area for the kids. Um, we do not anticipate actually having kids here long enough to engage in the kind of programming you're talking about around kitchen skills or things like that. I think it would not at all, it would, it would be um, not safe mm -hmm. um, for many of the kids who are there. So then, and one of the things that um, the Beckett, Jeff Karen from Beckett has voiced as a concern to me with his when there, when there was discussion about whether we should have two kinds of programs in this building, he said it's really hard to have different levels of um, permit, permissiveness when you're trying to run one program. So he, he, I guess what I'm trying to say is this is a really secure facility for kids who are in crisis uh, and we don't expect to be engaging in a lot of vocational type um, activities. Um, can I inter, I'm going to inter, interject. Um, on some level, this, it was our collective understanding that um, Covered Bridge was going to uh, take the place of um, Woodside and that we know the state no longer needed um, a 16 plus um, bed facility for justice involved youth because who needed locked facilities, a, a secure locked facility. We only needed a couple, four to six. People, kids, youth were at Woodside sometimes upwards of a year. They were attending, they, they went, when we all took a tour at various times in the last two years of Woodside, there were youth sitting at desks getting education. So now, Jennifer, you're talking about short term. I'm getting a bit confused. Sure. So Go ahead, Go ahead, Jennifer. No, yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, we found that that the model uh, that Woodside was based on, starting in 1984, the 30 bed concrete jail like facility where kids stayed for long periods of time, was really um, not a ther not a therapeutic milieu, and where kids made significant progress. I think what we're finding is that um, Vermont's need for that type of facility given its investments it's been making over um, many years in terms of community-based services and treatment um, and investing in all ranges of, of, of care uh, have really led to a, a decreased need for a, a Woodside type facility. You know, what we, what we envision is a, a facility 
um, that's secure, that can serve up to six. That's kind of what we envision, what I think the max we would need for this. Um, and really with the principle that we want to treat kids in the least restrictive setting possible. And so once kids are stabilized, we want to move them quickly to that next um, placement for them where they can start stepping down and re-engaging more closely in the community. Thank you. Um, we have as a committee maximum of about 45 minutes. And I do know that we're going to lose at least two committee members in 15 minutes, one of which is Representative Rosenquist. So um, he has his hand up. So um, I want to give he and Representative Wood the next 15 minutes to ask whatever questions of clarification or questions in general. Thank you. <clears throat> what I was wondering about was the uh, the staff that is going to be there on an overnight basis. I didn't really see facilities for them. Looked like nice facilities all the way up on the third floor, but we're hearing that that's not going to be necessarily used the way I understood it. But uh, where is the res residential staff that's going to see these the the youth through the through the night? I guess is what it amounts to. So the staffing pattern will be designed as such that they'll, they'll be um, working with the kids in shifts. So there won't be like a sleep uh, staff that like spend the night and sleep on the shift. They will be awake um, at all times and monitoring. And you know, if a youth wakes up and needs needs assistance or whatnot, um, and just keeping their eye on things. Obviously, the staffing uh, will look a little different, but they will be awake staff at each shift. They won't be spending the night and like sleeping. Um, it'll be awake staff is the model we're using. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, Representative Wood or Representative Rosenquist, do you have um, questions either about these slides or, or a, a question in general about this? And just um, to continue, one, one more question absolutely. would be, are, this is like the access to the building, like the doors near the, uh, the bedrooms and all that. Are they permanently locked and would have to have staff operate the doors or what? Yes, the do all the doors here in and out of the facility and movement into the facility will be electronically monitored and, and released doors. And so on the on the floor with the great room, there will be an, a space that will have a control room that will be monitored 24 seven with, with uh, you know, monitoring the camera system, but also, um, you know, the, 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 the movement of youth and, and staff throughout the building through the locked doors. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I want to follow up to actually your comment of a, a few minutes ago in that, I'll be honest, I'm not feeling confident that, um, that youth are gonna move in and out of this facility as quickly as maybe we, we would hope that they would. I mean, just know that there, there are always issues with um, whatever the you know, next least restrictive setting is or moving them to another placement and things get backed up or, um, you know, court dates get postponed and uh, or family issues take, take over. And um, I don't know, I don't really know how to phrase this in the, in the form of a question, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm just really am um, trying to figure out how that is all going to play out here. Um, I just think that we need to plan for the potential of um, youth being here longer than you might anticipate them being here. And um, so I, I guess it's just something I need to grapple with. Um, I, uh, and, you know, you, you, in one hand you said we didn't need a facility like, like Woodside on the flip side, you know, this looks very similar to a facility like Woodside only in a nicer outside and on a beautiful setting. My feedback. Mm -hmm. 
if I could respond a little bit, um, I, I, I agree with you. I think that we're, I personally, as we think about the lease, am struggling with, or not the lease, but the program um, contract. I think about how do we, how do we make sure it's a short-term facility with, with those variables that you pointed out around court hearings and, you know, maybe the child isn't settling the way he should. Um, and the concern I have about um, allowing it to be longer is, is sort of this idea, if you build it, they will come, right? And that's, that's the idea, the same thing. And, and all those variables that you talk about play into that. So we are, all, what I can say is we are um, giving it our best shot to try to manage those. And we're thinking, we're trying to think about that. So we're open to any and all um, assistance around that because we don't we don't want this to be a long term facility and that's um, one of one of my concerns is making sure that that we don't allow that to happen and that will require us thinking about what are our other treatment options in the community and how can we make sure that those are well supported so that we can in fact um, keep moving kids to less restrictive alternatives when when they need to be moved. Yeah, I'll just, I'll add to that if I can. Um, I think research shows very clearly that any prolonged periods in, in placement settings such as this is, is, can actually um, be more harmful than helpful. And there's, there's typically windows of opportunity where youth um, are engaged and ready to move on to the next steps. And then it becomes the work of, of us developing those pathways forward and opportunities along the continuum of care to support their next steps and the focus really shifting to that arena so that we're not, we're not creating a space um, to accommodate a long-term placement in a setting that we know might not be helpful overall for, for kids. Um, Jennifer and committee, we seem to, which is appropriately moved off of the physical space and we probably should move off of that if so if Julie could take that off the um, shared screen. And I do see though, um, that Representative McFawn has a question. <clears throat> and I am wondering if the third piece of your, I think, Commissioner, that you said you had three aspects that you were gonna go through. Did I think that right? I mean, yeah, and, well, Jennifer touched on the third earlier, which is the, the treatment program component. And I didn't okay. know if, if we wanted to pull that up and Jennifer could walk you through some of the assessment tools that are being going to be used in the facility. Well, well I have given the one, and I have not forgotten Representative McFawn, your question, but I think based on the questions that I am hearing from folks, especially as, as it has to do with um, where youth are and length of time and um, balancing that with to use um, Jennifer, your comments, um, if you, a concern about if you build it, they will come. And one of your first slides said um, that one of the goals was um, to, that youth was, children and youth reside and receive treatment in the least restrictive environment. So one of the things that probably would help us will be to, to understand what are the, um, other alternatives when um, children and youth cannot be at home and cannot be in a foster home, but need to be in some sort of, um, because I think that's some of where some of these questions are. But um, Representative McFawn has had his hand up. And Very he quick made, one. Yeah. Um, we have some experience with the, uh, I'm sure, the average stay of kids that are at the Beckett facility in New Hampshire over the past year or so. What's the average stay of those kids? We would have to uh, work with Beckett to get you that data, uh, Representative McFawn. I, we don't have that with us today. Okay, that, that might think, answer, yeah. give us a little bit of an answer toward the question of how long the kids are going to stay there. And I, I just have one concern. One of the concerns that um, with, with Woodside or where the kids were being placed 
between Woodside and, and where they are in New Hampshire now was escape. Um, I look at that elevator in the middle of the building. I'm sure it's going to be a keyed elevator. But if you're securing the bottom floor and parts of the other built parts of the building are not secure upstairs, um, if someone gets a hold of that key, they're gone. Yeah, so the areas of the building represent McFawn where the elevator will stop at, at so, so it's like say a youth gets in the elevator in the basement, the first floor, what I'll call it. They'll be able to take it to the second floor. That will, that will um, they will exit the elevator into a secure space. And the same will be if somehow it went to the third floor, that is a, in that spot where it opens up, it will be a secure space as well is my understanding so that um okay it doesn't then, i'm looking at the schematic right now it doesn't look secure to me once you get out of that elevator you can go well they would need well the yeah well, and then we'll, they go down we'll to work the second with the yeah, I'll, what I'll do, uh, Representative McFawn, is we'll work with the architects to get the answer to your question. I, I think, uh, yeah, I, th I think what you should do, Sean, is this. Make sure that the escape pod is clean, that they can't get out of that building, because that will, the, the, the people in the community, that's, that's one of their main concerns. If the, one of them gets out or two of them gets out, mm -hmm. OK, so I think what you have to do is make sure that it's solid. There's no way they're going to get out. If everything works right right now, I, I mean, I'm I'm not an escape artist, but I think I could get out of that building. Chopper, <laughs> I'm representing McFawn. I, I, I believe that the commissioner has heard your concerns and your questions and yes. and and the I would say the import of them is that um, in the planning, there has to be community approval and, and permit and stuff. And so you're suggesting areas that they look at so that both the children or the youth are treated, responded to well, and that the community move quickly forward. Yes. Yeah, I'll anticipate their questions. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Commissioner or or Jennifer one or Jennifer two. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to go back to <clears throat> and we all as a committee were part of a hearing. Oh, was it just last Friday with um, Senate? <clears throat> judiciary um, where there was um, concerns expressed around um, moving youth from placement to placement to make room for other youth. Um, that was one of the, you know, sort of things. And so I think what some of the, our questions are, um, if this is going to be short term, if you're saying practice and current best practice and where things have moved is not to have long-term and that the youth won't need this kind of longer term facility. Okay, so where are they gonna go? Um, and, sure. and, and, and since people are saying right now, we don't have enough of those, whatever you interim, not interim, but um, intermediate level um, residential facilities, what I used to call group homes. Um, where are the kid, where are the youth going to go? So and how we, are we addressing that? So we actually use a wide variety of uh, community providers for uh, different uh, types of residential care in the state. We have um, uh, a number of kids in state and out of state in residential treatment. And I was just trying to see if I had that sheet with me today. Um, but, you know, we have close to between 120 and 140 children um, in residential care 
um, in state and out of state in a, a wide variety of programs. Um, those are kids who are not, is it clear, those are kids that we sort of, I, I've sort of moved you off of and I apologize, but those are not necessarily kids who um, are just as involved. Correct. I mean, it, it includes both. And so okay. that would be um, <laughs> kids in our child protection system and then kids in our juvenile justice system. I would say it's probably, and this is ballpark, 80% of the kids in our residential system of care right now our child protection youth and, and the other, you know, 20 to 30, depend, you know, 25% are juvenile justice kids. And, they, and they're in a wide variety of programs. Those out of state are in more um, programs specifically tailored to meet their needs just because we are a small state and don't have a large number of kids needing that type of specific service or treatment. Can, can you give us an example of to meet their needs? Um, so you, you may have a child who uh, who exhibits behavior, and Jennifer Herbert, please feel free to jump in here. Um, that that may um, exhibit, you know, in terms of their release of, of 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 you know their behavior as they set fires. And so we don't necessarily have programs that specialize in treating you know that condition. And so we may need to work with a provider out of state. Um, that does provide that, that has a provider that does provide that level of treatment. And that can be, you know, very unique across the spectrum of needs um, where we would use an out of state um, provider. I would say another area where in terms of residential care that we may rely more on out of state providers and in state are our, our youth with a complex developmental disability and mental health needs um, co-occurring. Um, that we have limited in-state treatment capacity there. And so we may utilize an out-of-state provider for youth um, who have those co-occurring conditions. Um, so it, it really is depending on the unique needs of the kids and what their, and what their needs are that where we would look to serve them. Uh, we also have lots of kids in programs in state. What we're finding right now, the pandemic is putting pressure on the system in a couple of different ways. We actually have a lot of um, contracted beds that aren't being used right now, but are, it's just because of the pandemic, it, it, it's stressing how kids move through the system. One, you heard testimony that just transports, mm -hmm. finding sheriff's departments uh, to transport kids, it has been a challenge. We, we believe we have a solution for that, but then also the staffing of those facilities and the health and safety regs and how they admit uh, youth and move youth out um, and then if a, there's a positive with either a youth or a staff, you know, they kind of have to shut down until we can do, you know, you know, triage that a re health response. And so that's really putting pressure on our system right now. Um, we believe once we're through the pandemic, that pressure should alleviate and, and we'll be able to access more of the beds that we have under contract. Um, but right now the pandemic is putting pressure on the system in ways I don't think we knew at the beginning, but that we're seeing it manifest now. So, 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 Commissioner, your department broadly mm -hmm. um, around child care and around homelessness was really quite creative in ensuring that um, those impacts on space and congregate living, et cetera, were creatively and effectively responded to. Um, I have to say, I haven't quite seen that. You, you haven't shared with us mm -hmm. um, the creative and effective response or the, um, as you say, the, the impact of the pandemic on health and congregate living for this population. So, yeah, so, you know, we have provided um, in terms of the, uh, you know, our lower levels of care, there's been several rounds of financial support to help support foster parents in maintaining um, youth in their care uh, in terms of meeting, you know, the increased cost of, of, of you know, during the responding to the okay. pandemic and so, um, uh, there as well. We've also worked. So, so when I'm, I'm going to ask you lots of questions. Sure. Sorry, Sean, sure. Uh, Commissioner. Um, so you're, you're supporting foster parents. Yes. So, um, and you gave an example of money. Yes. 
So how much, so, um, okay, I'm a foster parent. I've got two kids in my care. Mm -hmm. I'm getting $40 a day. Yeah, they were um, uh, targeted payments that started at the beginning of the pandemic and then um, the Joint Fiscal Committee allocated additional resources um, um, uh, in December to go out to foster parents as well. I, I'm just trying to get to yes. um, the individual foster parent and how much is it? Um, I don't yeah, I, I would have I don't have those details with me, but we can provide that information to the committee good, for sure. Good. Because I I realize that that the um like everything, there is a range um of um and commissioner, I will say and I will stand corrected when you get me the um information. But once upon a time one could say it will cost me more to board my dog when I go out of town in what the state pays foster parents to take care of troubled kids. And if that is true, and we're now asking them to do more, I wanna know how we're, so we're supporting with money. Are we supporting them with anything else? I don't care about money. I don't know what to do with these kids. How are, how are we helping foster parents with that? With the community, uh, um, so basically community services to support foster parents. Yes, and then also um, making sure we have a rapid response team. So if um, there's a positive um, case of either a foster parent or a youth in their care that we uh, provide supports to make sure um, that uh, you know th that family is supported and that youth is supported. Um, and that, that response could look a variety of different ways depending on the circumstances. But yeah, so we do, we do have that. And that's in terms of the um, lower level foster um, care. We are also working on um, an initiative right now that we just kicked off in the last week or so looking at trying to provide some enhanced um, uh, foster care services um, to boost our community-based level of care. And so, you know, you know, we're at the early stages of that work, but that's something we've kicked off recently as well. Um, and so you, you should see something in the near future on that as well. Um, also, we've been working with our, our in-state providers, you know, in terms of, you know, making sure they have the proper guidance um, in terms of health and safety with, with, you know, with the youth. And if there's a positive case um, and we need to, you know, um, you know, work with them so that they can, um, you know, limit the number of youth they have in their program. And we've also increased rates um, through this for some programs as well to help support them um, with the increased burden that, that they're seeing as well. And have those increase in rates continued for, oh, let's keep our, let's be positive, for only six months in the upcoming budget? Um, those rates um, are, aren't limited. It will be based on, you know, it's based on the cost of of their care. And so as long as their costs remain that cost, that will be their rate, you know, through the rate setting process that, that you know, there's a, you know, depending on the type of provider, you know, there, there might be a Medicaid rate, but then we use rate setting for other PNMI, you know, providers. So, right. I, yeah. I, perhaps I misunderstood you. Yeah. Um, I thought you said that there are some enhanced based on the <clears throat> unique needs or, um, of the during the pandemic, that there were some enhanced services and supports. Yeah, so certain uh, we've worked with so, uh, uh, one provider in particular in southwestern Vermont, where they made some changes to their program and ex, um, made some expansions, um, and then also uh, included a crisis bed in there as well for access at any time of the day. Um, you know we. Uh, you know, that that led to a change in, in the cost structure of their contract. But then on top of that, um, they were having increased staffing costs and whatnot just because of responding to the pandemic. And um, we worked with them to provide an additional rate enhancement to make sure um, that, that they were staying solvent and not incurring any losses to make sure we were meeting their needs. Have we lost any um, group homes or residential providers? I'm not aware of any due to COVID, so I, but I would need to check with our team on that. 
I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about how creative you were and the department was, for instance, in terms of childcare and the reimbursement in childcare was not based on attendance for a while, but a based on capacity. Mm -hmm. And um, if we are talking about reimbursing, we're talking about rate setting and if rate mm -hmm. setting is based on who's in the bed, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned about the long-term viability. Yeah, and, and of I would need to check with my team, but there is a process uh, that we call extraordinary relief when providers um, experience some difficulty financially that we can support them. And I would need to check with my team, but I believe we may have used that process for some providers to make sure that they're, they're supported. I just don't have the specific yeah. details with me today. Sure. I mean, normally I don't care about money. I'll just spend it. Um, but um, I am concerned about um, there being um, sufficient mm -hmm. um, services between living at home and being in um, a hospital-based or a locked facility, all that whole range in between, which is consistent with your goal, which is that, that children and youth are in um, as much as possible um, you know, in the community or in the least restrictive environment. Um, so both in terms of where does covered bridge fit in to the system and how are we going to be supporting it, the rest of the system in this upcoming budget? Sure. Okay, I stopped asking questions. Are there other questions from, um, are there questions from other members of the committee? Representative Redmond. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just a question about the broadband issue um, and, and what's involved, like is that a doable project? Because I think the, um, the virtual hearings, the ability of you know, um, kiddos in that age group to be able to watch TV, you know, like all of those are, that's an important part of a successful formula. So I'm curious about the broadband question and what's involved, and also um, the municipality and the community. Um, wondering, I know that you know you're working the process through with them, and that's terrific. Um, it, you know, it, if there, if people did, you know, have concerns, is there, um, you know, are you able to proceed and move forward in working with them, or is there, you know, ever a point where, um, you know they could prevent it. I'm, I'm just curious if that's even an option or if um, you know, that's, not, that's not a concern. Thanks. Oh, it, 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 so uh, I'll answer the first piece. Uh, the broadband is doable. We've looked into it and um, we know what it's gonna take to upgrade that line and we're prepared to do that. Um, in terms of the community engagement, um, it's an, it, that is a crucial piece of this project. And, um, and it's an important piece of this project. And so we've started that engagement and uh, we wanna reach out particularly to the community members who spoke um, and who live um, in the vicinity of that, uh, you know, um, on some of the traveled roads you go to get to this facility, who expressed concern, uh, you know, similar to what um, Representative McFawn about elopements, people getting, you know, youth getting out of the facility um, and, and then concern for their safety if that happened. Um, and so, I think there's a lot we can do to work with, with those community members to help um, uh, put processes or, or procedures in place or other mechanisms to meet their concerns and work with them. Um, and then obviously, you know, we need to go through the town permitting process. And so, the, you know, that, that is the, their town's process. And so we need to see where that, where that goes. Um, it is already permitted. As, as a residential treatment program in their community because it was operating as such, um, but it was, it was for up to 12 youth and this will be for six. Um, so it's a smaller footprint youth wise, but although a, a higher level of acuity. Um, and also it, it's a secure facility instead of a staff um, secure facility. Um, and I don't uh, wanna be as presumptuous to say that, you know, um, we're going to move this forward without community support. I think it's important that we work with the community 
and, and make sure they have a comfort level with this project before we sign any contracts or lease agreements or, or uh, you know, and, and start making investments in this, in this facility that we know we have the support to do so. That, that's crucial. And I'll just, thank you. And I'll just throw in at one more question about, um, and I brought this up last time about staffing. Um, you know, have you looked into the whole staffing question around, I, you know, I know that that area is along the I-91 corridor, which is great because, you know, that brings people from a lot of different directions. Um, do you feel confident that you're going to be able, because this is a specialized kind of staffing, do you feel confident that you're going to be able to come up with the people you need? You know, um, you, you mentioned a wake overnight, um, which, you know, you, you need a certain, um, a person with a certain kind of background to be able to do that. And a wake overnight staff is traditionally very hard to hire. So I'm just, just wondering what your thoughts are about the staffing piece. Yeah, uh, you know, and we've spent a lot of time discussing staffing and, and that a lot of those conversations formed whether this was a project to move forward with, because as you pointed out, it is in Newberry, Vermont. Um, and, you know, Beckett runs several programs across the river in I think Pike and another community not too far from there. Um, and they've been running those programs for quite some time, albeit um, they uh, do not pay the level of wage that we will be paying in this facility here within the benefit structure that we'll be paying. So they believe based on their experience and then the wage structure we'll be paying that they, they'll be able to hire and maintain and keep the staff that they hire. Is it... Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I see another question from Representative Brumstead, then I do want to give you and your staff if you have um, any final comments, because it's about two, any final comments, but first, um, Jessica, uh, Representative Brumstead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I My question is around education. I know that you're hoping that the, um, that the folks that are here won't be there that long, but in when we looked at Woodside, they had a great little educational program going as well it seemed anyhow um, from my visit and I wondered about high school equivalencies and if you would be working with the kids to get them there and then my other question might be really not I shouldn't say dumb but I feel like I just am not sure so I'm going to ask it um are these are they all males in the facility yes. okay yes yeah um, we, there will be an edu education component and there'll be educational, um, and, you know, staff on site to work with the youth. And I would defer to Jennifer, uh, you know, if you have more to add to that, but that, that is, that is going to be a, a, a critical piece of, of the program that's going to be provided to the youth is that educational component. Thank you. And they'll be getting their schoolwork from whatever high school that they were in before as well. So that's. And the female justice and um, we're going to continue to be receiving questions about this facility and is it meeting the needs of Vermont? And you said it was a male only facility. So it might be helpful if you provide us um, what will happen to female justice involved youth and how many perhaps over the past couple of years, how many females were at, were at um, did we serve at Woodside and how many did we need to serve elsewhere? Because that will be a question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and, and I know that um, uh, uh, young women were served at Woodside at one time. Uh, when I came on as commissioner, uh, they were no longer being served at Woodside and we were using other uh, placement uh, treatment, but we can get you that information in that just, case. Just, yeah, and we do have one more question. Um, Representative Whitman. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add uh, really quickly, in addition to male, female, looking at uh, non-binary uh, transgender youth as well. Jennifer, I didn't, um, I didn't know if you want to jump in here in terms of any work that you may be doing around that for this 
center? Yeah, so we're going to be developing policies around that. And when possible, we're going to want to place based on um, the gender identity preference, but we're, we're going to approach it on a case by case basis. Um, and we're in the kind of the policy and, and practice procedures of that. Thank you. Yeah. And um, Commissioner, in the five, uh, ta Tapper, is this a quick question? Because it is 2.54. It sure is. What are you doing now with that population? Jennifer, I didn't know if you wanted yeah, to jump, <laughs> jump in here <laughs> again as well. That's a good question. I can speak to what was being done at Woodside and uh, there were a few different practices that were developing um, kind of in, in accordance also with the gender responsive care and training that was being uh, implemented or attempted to be implemented before the closure um, and, and operationalizing certain components of uh, starting from even the search process, any security measures, and having that be the gender preference of the youth um, and placement uh, based off of gender preference and just creating any accommodations that would uh, lead to a, a greater sense of safety. And so with placement of particular use right now, I'm not aware of any particular cases um, currently that, are, that have brought this up. Sean, I'm not sure if you. Yeah, and you know, we can work with our residential um, team at FSD and um, provide any data that we have or uh, additional information on this um, right, area thank you. for the committee for sure. Commissioner, you have um, five minutes to leave us with your, um, you, or you and your staff with anything you'd like to leave us with today in our conversation. Yeah, I, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to be here today. Um, you know, this has been an ongoing conversation, um, you know, about the, the, you know, the status of Woodside dates back many years. You know, this committee was actively involved in, in the decision to close it um, and, and is, you know, actively involved as we build out this one component of our system of care here. Um, and then also, I think, um, making sure that we have um, other areas of our system of care are as robust as well. And, you know, we appreciate that work and your attention to it. Um, you know, we're excited by the progress we've made here in, in the amount of time that, that we've had available, you know, starting this fall. A lot of work has occurred. There's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, but we want to make sure that we're keeping this committee apprised each step of the way, and particularly at critical decision points. Um, you, you know, we've received a lot of great information and things to think about today. Um, and I would just say that the, but you know, that we, in the restatement budget in September, you know, we did have 1.2 million set aside for renovation cost. You know, it's looking like those will be closer to, to three to 3.2 million. And so there's 2 million more in, in our BAA of one-time uh, money for, to complete the renovations of this facility. Uh, obviously, you know, we would not make those investments unless we had um, full assurance that this project can move forward with the support it needs. Thank you. And um, nice to meet. I appreciate meeting the, um, the two new staff and uh, uh, Judy Rex, you got off by not having us ask you questions, but now you have a sense of our committee and we know who we know where you sit now um, within the department. So we may be wanting to hear from you as well in your policy uh, response. So um, thank you all. Uh, this ends our Friday afternoon, February 12th, House Human Services Committee uh, meeting focused on um, covered bridge and as well as in terms of um, how, how, how Vermont is, is responding to and serving um, youth, especially justice-involved youth, but youth in need.